Hey, it's Carlo Perusa, and today I am with a UFC lightweight. He is on a three-fight win streak. They call him Beast Boy, Mr. Mike Davis. Mike, how are you doing, man? I feel really good. I'm like happy. I'm happy lately. That's awesome. So to start off, how did Mike Davis get into the world of mixed martial arts? Um, you know, it's the, that typical story where people, you know, the bullying and you want to try out something to defend yourself. And now all of a sudden you're a fighter. <laughs> you know, and once you started engaging in MMA, um, did the bullying, did that help? You know, did that give you some more self-confidence? Did that help with that? Yeah. Well, what I think it gave me was a lot of respect because now people see me as a fighter, a boxer and, and a wrestler and stuff like that. So they were, Kind of like, oh, whoa, don't don't bother him. He's a boxer. He, he'll punch you up and stuff like that. So it helped me a lot with my bullying uh, problem. You know, it's pretty crazy. I've seen a lot of fighters talk about that they were bullied as a kid. And, you know, one of them, a prominent champion, George St. Pierre, he said he had really yeah. bad bullying issues. And uh, I don't know if you've ever heard this story, but I was watching in an interview. He was saying that years after the bullying, he was champion in the UFC. He was driving his car downtown Montreal and he pulled up to a red light, and one of his bullies who bullied him the most was begging for change on the side of the street. Have you been able to encounter your bullies since then? No. Uh, ever since high school, when I left high school, I have not seen them since. But they have reached out to me uh, via DM or Facebook Messenger, and we're like, Mike, uh, I'm so proud of you, happy to see you doing great, like, like buddy buddy but i mean in my head i'm just like i kind of i remember how you used to treat me so i don't really care so at what point in your career did you think you know this is something i can do seriously i can kind of make a career out of this my third pro fight after my third pro fight i decided that i was good enough because i haven't lost all the way up to my third pro fight and um after that, I figured I can make it to the UFC. I'm 3-0 as a professional fighter. I'm 10-0 as an amateur more, uh, MMA fighter. I have a, one boxing. I got three professional boxing fights, three amateur Muay Thai. I, like, I haven't lost, so I can probably do this. Like, I'm, I'm very good at this. Let me, let me make a living off of it. And now, how did you go by actually finding your first professional fight? How did that process go? I was with um, a manager, like kind of like a micromanager, because uh, right now I'm with big management. But he was the owner of a gym in Port Orange. His name is Pete White. And when I went to his gym, he was already finding fights for the lower level amateur fighters and, and his own professional boxers he has. So he managed to get me a fight. And I just rolled with it. You know, I've noticed that you have several fights for Island Fights. Obviously, Dean Tool runs that promotion. Um, how did you get hooked up with Dean, and how did you enjoy uh, fighting on his cards? The same. Uh, Pete White is good friends with Dean. So we uh, reached out with Dean. Um, I was going to fight for Combat Night, but again, Dean got me and treated me very well. So I just stuck with that promotion. He was the only promotion that I was able to get into that was able to find people that would come to the state to fight me. You know, it's kind of a funny story. We actually sat right beside each other a couple weeks ago at uh, Icon FC6 in Orlando. I was there. Yeah, yeah. I was right beside you. Yeah, we sat next to each other. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, overall, what do you think of promotions like that? You know, you have a guy like Jorge Masvidal teaming up with Dean, and they're offering these up-and-coming pro guys, you know, an avenue to get to the big shows. How important is that for the sport? super important but however um when it comes to picking people for the ufc i feel like they are getting very lenient on it so if you have a couple wins doesn't matter who it's against they'll give you a contender series fight and they're bringing so many people into the ufc is getting kind of overcrowded you know speaking of the contender series you were five and zero as a pro you got to fight sadiq youssef in the contender series Things didn't go your way, but overall, how was that experience? And did you learn a, a couple things from that that maybe changed you as a fighter, gave you a new approach on things? 
Yes. Um, again, when I was training up to that point, I was with a boxing gym. So everything my training was based around um, was boxing. So I never really figured I use my wrestling or to use my my jujitsu in a fight or kick most it's mostly just my hands so after that fight when I lost I really dug down into who I am as a fighter and if I want to keep fighting that I have to make changes I got to do MMA not rely so much on my boxing so I went to um uh Fusion XL which I am at now, but back then I went down to Fusion Excel and trained with Julian Williams, who helped me incorporate MMA into my boxing. Just not even just like coaching wise, it was just being at that gym and seeing how they do MMA classes and mixing this and that. I had to swap to be a fighter. That helped me a lot. You know, following the loss at the Contender Series, you were able to fight in the UFC again, and you fought a very tough guy in Gilbert Burns, obviously one of the biggest names in the sport. That one didn't go your way as well, but how was that? How was fight week for the first time in the UFC? Was there any added pressure? You know, was it different than anything else you've been used to? No, I, I had just fought at 145 three weeks prior to getting offered Gilbert Burns. So I was kind of still in the mindset that I just fought. And then they offered me Gilbert Burns on like five days notice. So it wasn't really anything. All I had to do was get a few pounds off. So I was only focused on that. And then the, the, the reason I think the reason I lost that fight was because I'm, I'm like a child at, at mind. And when I got to this event and I, I saw the lights, I saw the 16,000 people in the crowd and, and everyone screaming my name, people reaching out for me. I kind of got overwhelmed and I wasn't, focused and now do you think you benefit at all from being in there with a guy you know like gilbert burns i do because that's the like creme de la creme he's up at the top top five of a division that's above what i fight at so and that was two divisions above me back when i fought him so i think if i was able to handle myself that well against a top fighter like that then I definitely I belong here. And I've proven it ever since I have not lost. So when you took on Thomas Gifford, you took that fight at about four days notice. You yeah. know, similar to well, the my, two, my first two fights were short notice. Yeah. What was going through your head? What was explain me the situation? Where were you? What was going on when they called you and offered you the Gifford fight? And uh, was it a no brainer to say yes? I was I was at the gym. Um I was training. I was just did like 18 boxing rounds with Kimon uh, Evan. He's an undefeated professional boxer. And I got the call. And then he said, you have like one day to decide. So I trained as hard as I could that night to see how my cardio felt. Um, it was Tuesday or was it Tuesday? It was, I think it was Tuesday. Yeah. Tuesday. Trained as hard as I could push myself, wrestled as much as I could box as much as I could. I, I promise you I did like, like 60 something rounds of sparring and moving that day. I was like, you know what? I feel pretty good. Well, yeah, let's, let's take that fight. I didn't know who he was. I didn't know who Thomas Gifford was. All I knew is that he was scheduled to fight Brock Weaver and Brock Weaver. I feel like was going to win that fight. And I do very well against Brock Weaver. So I, I just figured I'm going to go in there and win. Get my first UFC win. You know, obviously you won, but you were very dominant in that contest. A lot of people thought that fight should have been stopped. It should have been made it to the third round. Were you surprised no. it lasted as long as it did? Yeah. I, I figured um, after the first round where I rocked him and at the very end of the fight, he was kind of, he wasn't there, but he was defending still. And I, I didn't really know where I should go or what I should do. Um, I definitely made a mistake when I dragged him to the ground. I figured he was wobbled up top. Let me, but he's defending still. Let me bring him to the ground where I can land some clean shots. But when I brought him down, he's still fighting back. So I didn't, I really didn't expect it. I thought I'd finish it there. And that was a mistake on my part. But yeah. And at the end of every single round, he was rocked, wobbled, and they could have stopped it at any one of those points. Now in that third round, you finished the fight with that right cross. Um, going into deep waters of that fight, was the mindset still to go for the kill? 
And walk me through that point um, when you were able to pick up the finish. Were you looking for it? Did it just come about? How did that all work out for you? After, um, wow, after round after round and he kept coming back, I just knew that the kid wasn't going to be finished. So I just kept fighting until something happened. Either the ref stopped it because I hit him too much or I finished him. I didn't really, I wasn't looking for a finish. I wasn't trying to do anything. I was just fighting back. And then uh, when I did get the finish, uh, obviously I was ec ecstatic about it. It was my first UFC win. Um, I felt at that point in time at my peak, like this is what it feels to be a winner in the biggest organization in the world. You know, following that fight, you were off for a while. You know, things got a little yeah. sticky. The COVID pandemic came out of nowhere. You were off for about 14 or 15 months. How was that off time like for you? And what did you try to do to, you know, stay in shape and try to train? Well, yeah, after that fight, we went into the, the following month. Um, I was scheduled to fight Giga and I popped my rib. So I had to call out of that fight. But then uh, they offered me the fight again a few months down the road after COVID had started. And COVID had our lockdown where I wasn't able to do anything. My gym closed. Everything closed. Now I've, I gained weight. I was the heaviest I've been. I was like 180, almost 184. They offered me this fight for two weeks at 145. I want to fight. So I was like, sure, I'll do it. I tried cutting, I tried doing everything, and that was not happening. Not without the access to the gym and no sauna, nothing. So it was it was running in the heat with a sauna suit on. And it was just hurting my body, and my body did not want to cut weight. So that fight couldn't happen. And then after that, <clears throat> I got hit by a car. Like two two months after that, I got hit by a car. So my body was just really aching and all the time. I was trying to find a fight for September. They gave me an opponent. That opponent got kicked out of the UFC. Uh, that fight bout got scratched. I was looking for somebody. I was running low on money. I didn't have anything. And then um, finally, December, at the end of December, very end, uh, around like right before Christmas, they offered me a fight in Abu Dhabi. And I was like, yo, so we're going to Abu Dhabi. I got I to gotta fight. I don't care who it is. They told me it was some guy named Jones Mason. And I was like, cool. My manager showed me who he was. He was like on a three fight you losing streak. And I was like, this is perfect. This is a great fight. This is another win, a big paycheck. Let me get back in the in the swing of things. And then I get a message like 10 minutes later. Mike, wrong name. My, my apologies. Mason Jones. Here he is. 10 and 0. Multi-champ Cage Warriors. I was like, I still don't care. Let's do it. We're going to Abu Dhabi. Yeah. One thing that makes you very successful as a fighter is you're able to put so much pressure on your opponents and they eventually break. Mason Jones, he wasn't yeah. breaking. He was able to put up with that pressure. <laughs> Did that make you adjust during the fight? Uh, when I when I was scheduled to fight him, uh, we were waiting. It was fight week. And I've never looked at any videos of him. Again, I don't, I'm not a big study guy, so... I finally, I'm just scrolling on Instagram and I see a story where they had, they were playing like stories in the, the Explorer tab. And I noticed <clears throat> Mason Jones popped up and he's running like eight miles. And this is two days before the fight. I was like, are you kidding? This kid has cardio. Oh my God, this is going to be a fight. And then I closed it. And I was like, oh, uh, uh, let me, let me go for a run. And I go outside and I try to go for a run. I'm like, I get my cardio because I was already on weight. I was like 56, I think 57. So I didn't really have to cut any weight, but the heat out there made me really bad. So then when I got into the cage and I noticed that he would not stop, no matter what happened, he would always come forward. I didn't have to adjust. I just had to move a lot more. I wasn't, I wasn't the um, dominating fighter in that fight. I was the smaller fighter. I definitely, I was on my back pedal the entire time. You know, following that fight, you were extremely emotional during your interviews. Um, how satisfying of a victory was that for you, given all the things that happened, COVID, uh, you had COVID, obviously getting hit yeah. by a car, you know, there's oh, yeah. so many things I, I, COVID after. <laughs> I forgot about that. 
<laughs> There's so many things that went wrong. You were able yeah. to pick up that victory at all. Did you feel that that fight was kind of make it or break it for you in the UFC? Yeah. I felt like if because I lost to Gilbert Burns and then I won my Thomas Gaper fight, if it, especially I took so so much time off, regardless of the COVID and everything that was happening, that if I lost that fight, I would probably get kicked out of the UFC. Because in my head, it's um, in stone that if you lose two fights out of a four fight contract, you will either get one more chance on a third or they're just going to kick you. And because I lost my debut, I thought if I lost that fight, I would be gone. So it had a lot of it was a lot of stress. I never thought about it until I was doing the interviews and they asked me that specific question. But um, yeah, it was it was like a make or break for me. Now, overall, how did you enjoy the Fight Island experience? How was Abu Dhabi? Terrible. When because only because of COVID. When we we flew to Vegas, that's where we kind of gather all the fighters. Uh, we stay at that hotel we can't leave the hotel grounds we can't work out we can't do anything so the only way that you can continue to cut weight is to run out in the sun in the parking lot in a circle big circle that's all you can do so me and dustin <clears throat> me dustin and mike brown would just go out every morning run in a circle we had to stay there for a few days until we were able to fly or we were cleared and able to fly to abu dhabi where we had to quarantine to our room for three more days and every day we got tested twice for COVID. Once the testing was clear on the third day, we were able to wander the hotel grounds. And again, no gym. Oh, well, they have a gym, but there's no like training facility, no saunas, no nothing. So we just go outside and run. I was just running every single day and I felt miserable. Um, I wasn't able to explore. I, I know that. Uh, for the island, they have the cage on the beach. I wanted to go take pictures in a cage. Couldn't do that. Can't leave the island or the the hotel. I couldn't go to, uh, what is it, Dubai. I wanted to go over to Dubai and try some food out there. I couldn't do nothing. I was just stuck at this hotel. So it was kind of stuck. Obviously, that fight was on the Neil Magny versus Michael Chiesa card. But you were there. Were you there at the same time as Dustin Poirier? When yeah, he was yeah. I, me, and him, me and him were uh, hanging out most of the, the whole time. Were you there for that fight? Were you there when uh Poirier they wouldn't let me, they wouldn't let me stay? I asked them and I, I asked if he could get them to let me stay just because I fought on Wednesday and he fought on Saturday, but they said I had to fly back on Thursday. All right, right after the fight. You wake up and you're leaving. Now obviously Poirier guy that you're kind of close with. Um, were you expecting him to pick up a finish like that? Uh Dustin hits hard. So, yeah. Yeah. I knew that um, now because he is built into the frame of a 55er. Um, back at 45 when he fought Connor, he was weak. His like his mental state drains from cutting to 45. So now that he's 55, he has a lot more power. He's wiser. He's he's all there. And I knew that being in his camp this this whole time that it was going to go. Either a knockout or his just a decision, but you know, a couple months ago in October, you were originally going to fight Euros Medic. That one didn't happen, so you fought Borshev instead. Um I feel like they're the same mindset fighter. like there when you know you have to a guy cancels out and you have a new uh, opponent. Were you trained? Were there any similarities with Medic and Borshev that, that you guys were training with? I think that's what made it a decent fight to accept just even with the switch, because uh, Medic and um, Vicheslav, they're both a uh, very similar fighting style, uh, kickboxing, kind of low, lower level ground game kind of stuff. So I didn't really have to make any changes. It was They're both switch stances. I think Medic is pure Southpaw, but uh, Vicheslav fought Southpaw too, so... It's whatever. I, I was ready for whoever was there. You picked up the unanimous decision victory in that one. What do you think were the keys to your success in there? Um, definitely the wrestling. I mean, I, I come from a very big wrestling background, and not many people respect that I can wrestle. They don't think I can wrestle because I never do. I never really take anyone down, but whenever I shoot for a takedown, I, most of the time I get it. I think four out of five times I will get that takedown. So 
uh, that played a big part in slowing him down, uh, slowing down the striking. I did strike with him a bit to feel him out. I, I was also dying mid round. I think, I think round two when I was choking. So I had to, I don't know the wrestling. If you can't wrestle in the UFC right now, you, you shouldn't be there. You're on a three fight win streak now. Do you feel like you're at a very good place mentally and physically in your career? Do you feel like everything's being put all together right now? I think so. I feel like once you get to three and oh, uh, three in a row in the UFC, that you are at a a spot that ten uh, percent of the fighters will ever make it to. Three in a row in the the world's biggest organization. Um, and not only that, but I think one fifty five. 155 and 170 are the two hardest divisions in the UFC. So to be on a three fight win streak in this division makes me feel very confident that going forward, we're going to keep this streak going. Through your career, you know, when you look at your resume, you look at your record, you have a lot of finishes. Um, is that an important thing for you going into a fight? Are you looking for the finish? Are you looking for excitement? What are your thoughts on that? Um. <clears throat> Just mostly because I'm not like a super violent person. I never really go in there and I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm knocking this kid out today. I just feel like I go in there. I put my skill set on display. It's always either too much for someone to handle or, or it's, we're kind of like evenly matched, but there's little things that make me stand out a little bit and I get the win by decision. That's what happened for my last two fights. But yeah, normally, because when I started pro, I was fighting 45 and 55. I was always the bigger person. So when I step in the ring, I'm the one in charge. I just come forward. And that's why all my fin that's why all my fights end up in finishes, because the guy gets overwhelmed and I just find little spots here and there that put him down. Now you mentioned the pressure. Is that something that you train consistently? You know, try to put as much pressure as you can against your opponents? No, I I just know I'm I'm a pocket fighter, so I'm very my boxing is definitely where I shine, and I can fight in the pocket. I'm very good at finding openings. Um, I have no set striking criteria that I follow. I I've never been taught by a striking coach besides boxing. I've taught myself everything that I know, and when I throw punches, it's not the traditional one, two, three, uh, like uppercut i don't know the combinations i just i see where your hands go and i hit the opposite spot so that you raise this hand that's open i'm going there i'm my body will just move to those spots so i'm gonna hit you you mentioned earlier that you train with fusion excel you know there's some very high level guys who train there jack ray souza Adolfo vieira mike perry alex nicholson how beneficial to your career is being able to you know train with some very high caliber guys um, I'm not, I'm not sure because these guys have already experienced what it's like to be at the pinnacle. So they're not very hungry. Now training with them is fantastic. Of course they have the skill set, but sometimes they're just laid back and I'm still trying to be at the top. So I want hungry people now i get my my hardest training from some of the amateurs and some of the uh like beginning pros they're really good it's surprising now growing up did, did you have any fighters that you looked up to or there are any guys that you watched at a young age that maybe you tried to emulate your style after no i i never watched fighting never studied fighting never did anything fight related until um Never back down. I think that movie when that movie came out and I saw it and I was like, "Oh snap, this is kind of dope." <laughs> this guy getting bullied now. He's the not he's not the bully, but he's defending himself. He's doing what he wants. That's kind of like me, and I love that movie. And then ever since then, I wanted to keep learning how to fight. You mentioned earlier you don't watch a lot of film. You mentioned that you're not even really a big fan of the sport. You're just really good at it. Do you think that allows you maybe to have a better mental mindset and prevent you Definitely. from being burnt out? 
Definitely. That's just because people will go to the gym, right? They'll go, they'll train MMA, then they'll come home and then be like, oh, I got sub today. Let me, let me figure out why. Let me do this. Let me read some books. Let me watch some jujitsu videos. Let me study some opponent films. And they're just so overwhelmed with MMA that when it comes to put it all together, they kind of, they stutter. They, they're not fluid. Me, I go train. The minute I leave the gym, don't talk to me about MMA. I'm done. I'm going to, I'm a gamer now. After that, after that gym, I'm a gamer. You want to talk about movies? Want to go see a movie? Want to go to the mall? Want to go do something? Anything that doesn't involve MMA. Now, by any chance that you're a gamer, do you do any Twitch stuff or anything yeah. like that? Yep. I had a, a fun stream last night on Twitch. It was fun. We did a yeah, hot, hot sauce challenge with Dustin Poirier's new KO edition hot sauce and, uh, the hot ones challenge that you see on YouTube. We did the bomb, put that on. We played call of duty. And when we die, we take a wing with the hot sauce on it. It was horrible. <laughs> now, do you think that's some important thing, you know, for fighters to do is, you know, branch out and other things such as Twitch. Yeah. Because fighters, especially with, with the UFC, you get a very high following. You get, a lot of exposure. So if you're going to do something, and you're going to make yourself uh, marketable. You need to do more than just fight. And not many people know that. Not many people do that. Just a couple more questions here for you, Mike. Um, you, you mentioned in the past that MMA kind of saved your life in ways. Mm -hmm. Do you have any examples of that? Um, well, we can start with the bullying aspect. Um, I got bullied so much that I was a very depressed child. I was always alone. So, uh, suicide is a very, uh, talked about subject nowadays. And I believe myself to be very emotional back at my young days. Then, uh, we moved to me actually fighting now. And I, I love training. I love learning the skill, the, the, the set that comes with being an MMA fighter. My friends, uh, this story has been out there a lot. My friends were having a little party. They were drinking and smoking, whatever, at their house. They invited me over, but I couldn't go. I had training. I specifically refused to go because I wanted to go to training. I, I was loving the the knowledge I was getting and the, the feeling that I was getting from training. So later on, the, the next day, I see on the news that they were arrested. And uh, the story is that they got high and drunk and went out with the other people that they invited. And one of them had a gun and they were out uh, robbing people, apparently. And I'm glad that I was not there because um, as my best friends, I would 100% have gone out with them that night. So I decided to train MMA and that in turn saved me from the eight year sentence that they all got. I would have just been getting out of jail. I'm 30 years old. I would have gotten out. Uh, I was 60. I would have gotten out at 26 years old. I I'm four years. I would have four years of growth right now. Now, since you've experienced something like this, do, do you kind of hold yourself accountable to try to help others? If you see, you know, younger individuals who are going on a similar path, do you try to use your story to help them, you know, get a retrack on life? Yeah, I get the messages a lot because people have seen my story and they know. So they message, they reach out to me about bullying. They reach out to me telling me how they have a fight with this kid at the end of school. And I'm like, how about you go to a jujitsu class instead? And I mean, you'll learn a new new skill. You don't have to fight this kid. It's just worthless. It's pointless. You're not going to gain anything from it. I've never been in a fight before outside of a cage. Never. And I just refuse. I, I mean, I don't refuse right now. <laughs> right now, I'll, I'll fight. But uh, growing up, I mean, I was just so afraid of confrontation. So I always found the easy way out. Have you ever had kids tell you that, you know, your stories help them? Yeah. And a what lot. does that do for you? Is that a glorifying feeling? It is. I like to, I really do like to share my story. And I know that if kids are having trouble, that I'm a proven point that there's a greener side. 
All right, Mike, last question for you. We're almost done with 2022 here. We're going into 2023. What are the goals for Mike Davis? What do you want to accomplish? Are you trying to stay active? What do you want to get done? 2023. I'm I'm moving first. I'm as you can see behind me is my my kitchen pretty much and it's not the greatest for me to do gaming and stuff in. I, people don't want to come in here and see my vacuum behind me and stuff like that. So uh, I'm moving in a month, literally one month. I'll be in a new place. I'll have a professionally set up gaming room uh, for all my content and stuff like that. So you'll have Beast Boy behind me, all that stuff. Nice, nice little income there. And then uh, fighting wise, I want to start in March. I was supposed to have start in January, but little setbacks here i think we're gonna try and start for march 25th in san antonio texas start march and then i also want let's go march april we'll do june march june september and december i want to fight four times now do you have a name lined up i mean is have they given you anyone yet no no it's not even in the talks yet i just know um Two of my teammates are already scheduled for the 25th, which means that I'm trying to get an opponent as well for the 25th. The UFC is very keen on having a group come from one gym to fight. It's easier financially and way easier for all the admin, all that stuff. So it happens quite often. I think the 25th would be good to have Fusion show out, show up and show out in San Antonio. Well, Mike, I wish you nothing but the best in your career in 2023 and beyond. Thank you so much for talking today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Carlo.